Okay, hello. So this is the guest lecture on Bayesian inference and this is going to be done in two parts. So um, we have looked at Bayesian inference a little bit before but now we're going to look at it in depth and hopefully by the end of both parts you should feel quite confident about running your own Bayesian analyses. Um, the first part is going to be uh, about the theory um, and the second part will be more on the practice uh, but for this one in particular we're aiming this at students with you know some familiarity with frequentist traditional hypothesis testing and I'm not assuming any particular prior knowledge of Bayesian inference but I know that um, we have already mentioned this in uh, the previous module so recapping this briefly could potentially be useful. That said, this will hopefully be um, a self-contained lecture. Okay, so like I say, the, um, the session is going to be in two parts and this video is just part one. The core things that we're going to do are we're going to review the core conceptual ideas and um, the differences between the Bayesian and the frequentist approaches. We can do this at quite a high level, but then after that we're going to look at a very concrete example. We're going to use some code um, of Bayesian linear regression. Now the code I'm going to use here is going to be done in Python, um, so some of you might be more familiar with, with R, but Again, the aim of this is not to teach you any kind of programming as such. Um, so I wouldn't really worry about that. But for those of you who um, would like to, I'm presenting a few very, very simple bits of code in order to kind of just make things really concrete. What we're also going to do is to introduce the concepts of a prior, well, a posterior distribution talk loads about prior distributions. Um, so the posterior distribution is a way of summarizing your beliefs after having observed some data. So this is what we often want to know as scientists. We want to know what should we believe given some data. But we're also going to look at the concept of a Bayes factor and this is a way of kind of retaining some of the uh, hypothesis testing ideas but doing this in a Bayesian manner rather than a frequentist manner and I'm going to briefly highlight that um, Bayesian inference is still a relative newcomer in psychological science some areas of it anyway and in fact some of the um, kind of theory is still kind of developing here and so I'm going to highlight that there is still a bit of a debate about whether you should really summarise your knowledge in a Bayesian way using a posterior distribution or by using a Bayes factor. So I'm going to briefly highlight that. So you need to be aware of this uh, when you're reading papers, for example, which present results in a, in a Bayesian manner. OK, so part two... Um, will be done in a separate video, there'll be separate online materials, but this will switch from theory to practice and we're going to use the free software JASP. This is available on the student desktops but you can also just download this if you want to follow along on your own laptop. Okay, so also I just want to say before we dig into things I think that everybody will get something from this but some of the Bayesian concepts are very new um, so many of you have been brought up in this traditional framework of um, null hypothesis significance testing and so it makes you think about things in a certain way there's a lot of expectations um, of how you might go about things and there's a certain um, language the Bayesian approach you know, has its own concepts, its own ideas and terminology 
And so I want to point that out. It may not be um, immediately obvious on the first pass, but I think that um, given a couple of readings, then this will really hopefully help you quite a lot. Okay, so let's dive into part one. First of all, we'll start off with a bit of a recap about the core conceptual differences between frequentist hypothesis testing and Bayesian inference. So you will have seen um, this figure from previous lectures. So up the top we have the idea of a hypothesis and at the bottom we have some data that we, we might observe. And Bayesian inference is all about probabilities. And so what I've done here is to draw um, some of these probabilities on here. So if we look first of all at the arrow going from the top from hypothesis down to data, this describes what is the probability of some data that I happen to have um, given a particular hypothesis. So this is called the likelihood and this essentially is a deductive step which um, you can simulate and we have done this in the previous uh, in my previous guest lecture on hypothesis testing we have said given that the null hypothesis is true what is the distribution of data or the distribution of test statistics that I would expect to see so this is interesting but then we might do an experiment and we might actually collect some data and we might have that in our hands and so now we're interested in the arrow going from the bottom up from data up to hypothesis. And this is called the, the posterior. Um, so this is called the probability of a hypothesis given some data. So we'll talk much more about this shortly. We also, in um, the Bayesian approach, have the idea of prior beliefs over hypotheses. So this is something unique to the Bayesian approach, but I think it's quite important because if you think about different types of hypotheses, some hypotheses are very plausible, um, but others are not. So if you think about the hypothesis that um, I can read your mind, this is a very implausible hypothesis. And so you might want to take that into account when you're evaluating the probability that this is true. Right, so as I say, we have these um, three core components in Bayesian inference. We have the top-down deductive approach. This is called the, the likelihood. So this allows you to talk about um, what is the plausibility of any given possible data given a hypothesis. Then we also have the prior, which is our prior beliefs about um, the plausibility of hypotheses, totally independently of any data. This is just um, of what we know currently, what are our prior beliefs about these hypotheses. And then the key thing um, under the Bayesian approach, what we what we want, the goal here, is to figure out our posterior beliefs. That is, what should we believe about our hypotheses given some data that I've collected? So, like I say, in the previous frequentist lecture that we did on um, null hypothesis significance testing, we saw that um, we go in this downward direction the focus is very much on the likelihood. Now, one of the key important differences between the frequentist methods and the Bayesian methods is that the, the hypothesis, or um, you could say the state of the world, so for example, there, there is a main effect of uh, X on Y, or there is not a main effect. This is assumed to be true. Now, under the frequentist methods, 
the data that you happen to observe is just one of many possible outcomes. You happen to observe um, this particular set of data, but if um, you imagine when you ran the experiment, you split off into a parallel universe and you conducted exactly the same experiment, you could have collected um, some other set of data which was subtly different, but in both cases the hypothesis, um, the state of the world was still um, in, in the particular way. Now that contrasts to the Bayesian approach which is almost the opposite. So if we look at um, point one here, what I'm saying is that the Bayesian approach assumes now that the data is the thing which is fixed and known. The hypothesis or the state of the world, um, point two there, is not directly observable. Now, um, like I say, the opposite of the frequentist approach. Now, what I mean by not directly observable is that there is no way for us to look up the truth about the state of the world with absolute certainty and know it. The idea is that there is always some degree of uncertainty about the state of the world, but in a Bayesian approach, what you can do is you can do Bayesian inference, and so you can make inferences about the state of the world. Is this hypothesis likely, given my data, is that hypothesis likely um, given the data that I've got? And um, one of the key components that allows us to do this, to actually talk about the probability of hypotheses, is the prior. So if we look down here on the bottom right, I've drawn um, a version of Bayes' equation. So uh, the thing that we want to know is the posterior what is the probability of a hypothesis given some data that I've collected? And we can write this as, this is proportional to the, the likelihood, so that's the, the plausibility of the data under a given hypothesis multiplied by the prior beliefs of that hypothesis in the first place. Now, I'm going through this rather quickly, but what I'm doing here is sketching out the broad brush strokes of what's happening. So what I really want you to take away from this is that we have these, we have hypotheses and we have data. Under the fre frequentist approach, the hypotheses and the state of the world are fixed and the data is almost um, a free variable. You happen to have uh, pinpointed, collected some set of data but another hypothetical you may have collected some other data. The Bayesian approach, that's treated as the opposite. This is the data that you have. This is what we are working with. And what we want to do is to pinpoint our beliefs about different hypotheses given that data. So these, these are the core things that I want you to take away from this. So, now what we're going to do is to walk through a, a very specific example. So how do you actually do this? And we're going to use the example of Bayesian linear regression. So this slide is basically just a, a quick refresher. The details aren't necessarily that important, but um, I want everyone to remember that in a simple linear regression, we have the classic equation y equals mx plus c. So in this, x might be our predictor variable, our um, independent variable that we have measured, and m would be um, a parameter, so this is uh, like the, the slope of a line, and c is another parameter which describes the, the intercept. Y, of course, is our outcome measure or dependent measure. And so we're saying that the outcome Y is kind of a linear function of 
the input x. So that's basically uh, just a quick refresher on what the equation of a straight line is. We're just going to make up some data and fit a straight line to it, but we're going to do that in a Bayesian way. So first of all, we're going to um, basically simulate this kind of miniature world here where we've got x and y. We're going to create some fake data. The reason why we're doing this is because we are going to later do some Bayesian inference and what might be nice is if we can actually test how accurate our Bayesian inferences are. If we did that with real data, we wouldn't necessarily know what the truth is. We wouldn't know what the true linear regression um, equation really is. But if we make up data with our own regression, then we can do that. So the first step is we're going to simulate some data. Um, we're then also going to talk about our prior beliefs. We're going to define what we believe about our prior beliefs, which is um, the slope and the intercept. So this is unique to the Bayesian approach. And lastly, we're actually going to do some Bayesian inference. We're going to calculate how much we believe in a whole range of different parameter values. That's the slope and intercept. Um, after having seen the data. So this is the, the posterior. What is the probability of a whole bunch of different parameter values given some data that I have measured? So that's the general, but in our case we can see that the parameters are the slope and the intercept, so that's m and c, and the data that we've recorded is our dependent, uh, independent and dependent variable x and y. So that's what we're going to be calculating in our Bayesian approach. All of this will become um, much clearer as we go through. So um, we also, in a linear regression, we, we always have some degree of observation noise. Now, if you were doing um, this in a, in a real example, you don't necessarily know what the observation noise is. And so if you were a, a proper Bayesian, you would want to actually estimate the level of observation noise you have. For simplicity um, and to make plots that I'm going to show you in a minute easier to, to show, we're not going to do that. We're just going to assume that we know what the observation noise is. So we're going to set the standard deviation of observation noise at 0.2. Okay, now what we're doing is we're simulating some data. So up the top here we're defining a function and it doesn't really matter about the details here but we are randomly, uniformly randomly creating some um, x data and then we have our linear regression here so we have the, the average um, value is going to be the slope times the intercept. So that's mx, m times x plus c. And then we are adding some normally distributed observation noise. So what we do is we say, because we're simulating things, I am going to say that we know the true values of the regression equation. So we're going to say the true slope is 0.5 and the true intercept is 0. And the last line here is basically just doing this, it's calling that function above. So we're going to create um, 10 data points of x and y data using that function. So now we're going to uh, plot this. First of all, we're going to save that data because we might want to analyze it in JASP later on. But now um, let's plot this. So on the left, the black points show you our observations. So we clearly see we have the true regression line in red here, 
So this is um, y equals 0.5x plus 0. And so, but we also have observation noise, which means all of the points we observe do not lie exactly on that line. So that's what the plot on the left is. But um, the plot on the right here is a essentially a depiction of parameter space. Now we, because we simulated this experiment here, we knew what the truth was and we can see that we've got this red dot that says the true slope is 0.5 and the true intercept is 0. Now at the moment this is not a very interesting plot but in a short while um, we're going to be able to see our, how our prior beliefs um, can be viewed on this plot. But the first thing is what we're going to do is express our prior knowledge. So like I say, this is a unique step to the, the Bayesian approach and I think it's a really um, powerful and sensible one because um, we virtually always have some degree of prior belief when we're running an experiment we are literally we're not just totally clueless we might have some ideas now those ideas could be precise we could be working on um, a very well studied area we could have meta-analyses for example that really make us think that the regression slope is going to be a certain value but we might be coming at this um, with not so much knowledge and either way that's fine we can just express what that, that prior knowledge is. In this particular example, we're going to express um, not very much prior knowledge. We're going to say that our prior knowledge of M, that it's normally distributed maybe around zero with standard deviation one. And so our, our default prior belief is centered on zero so we're saying it's most likely that there's no um, main effect of m that the slope is zero similarly with c we're going to assume um, that our belief about the value of c is normally distributed around zero with standard deviation one now let's try and make that concrete what we can do um, is we can update our plot. Now if we look on the right what we have is our parameter space and what I've done is to essentially plot our prior beliefs that we just defined and that's shown in this color bar. So as we go from dark blue to light blue to white these are different combinations of slopes and intercepts which um, are more plausible. Now if you were doing this with real data you don't know what the true value is um, and that's your job to find out but we in our kind of godlike um, simulation mode we know what the true parameters are but we're going to pretend that we don't know and so our prior beliefs are quite diffuse. Another way of saying that is before we observe the data, there are many different plausible values of the slope and the intercept. Now on the left, what I've done here is to add in these grey lines. Now these are actually um, random samples from our prior beliefs. And so each one of these lines represents um, a a sample from our prior beliefs on the right. And so what we have is um, a whole series of lines where the intercept is kind of based around zero but it has a standard deviation of one and similarly um, the slopes is centered on zero but also has a standard deviation. So some of the lines are going up, some of the lines are going down, um, some of them are flat. So this is interesting. This is um, 
sometimes what people do when they do more uh, complicated models, they want to know um, how do my prior beliefs express themselves um, in relation to the data. So we have a visualization of um, the data, we've got a visualization of what kind of relationships are plausible given our prior beliefs, and we've got a visualization of what our prior beliefs actually are. So all that remains is to basically conduct some Bayesian inference. So if we look at this um, top equation here, um, we've got Bayes' equation. So we have the posterior, the probability of the parameters. Um, we can say the hypotheses, um, but that's what we're doing here. We're hypothesizing about the parameters. So what is the probability of parameters given some data? And from Bayes' equation, we know that this is proportional to the probability of the data given some parameters. So this is the likelihood term. And we just multiply that by the probability of the parameters in the first place. Now, I won't go um, into depth about the other equations, but this is basically just trying to make concrete what we actually mean here. It's all very well talking in general about the prior and the likelihood, but let's just quickly go through. So the prior, the probability of the parameters, we can make that concrete first of all by saying, well, what are the parameters? They are M and C. Now, we can express our prior beliefs by saying, well, they are normally, my prior beliefs about the slope, M, is normally distributed about 0 and 1, and my prior beliefs about C are normally distributed about 0 with standard deviation 1. And so if I were to give you a particular pair of um, M and C, you should be able to um, look up the probability of these things according to your prior beliefs, and you should be able to give me back a number. What is the prior probability of these parameters? We can do a similar thing um, with the likelihood. And this one is a little bit more complicated, but not much so. First of all, we can be more concrete about what does it mean, this probability of data given parameters. Well, the data is our x and our y, and the parameters are the slope and the intercept m and c. And what we're doing here is we're basically um, taking the product, so we're multiplying the probability of all the different um, y observations that we have, and we're saying that our observations are normally distributed around this regression line, mx plus c, with our known standard deviation. And this kind of product term is basically saying that we have observations we, we loop around our observations 1 to n, in our case we have 10, and we're basically multiplying all of these probabilities up. So if that was confusing to you, don't worry. Um, if that kind of starts to make sense, um, then that's great. But let's have a look at um, doing this in code. So this is a bit of a complicated slide, but um, the real business is um, only happening on a couple of lines here. So up the top, we're creating a function to calculate our posterior. So this is basically implementing Bayes' equation. So we want to give this function some parameters and some data. And so <clears throat> what we're doing is we are kind of unpacking the parameters, so M and C, we're unpacking the data, x and y, and what we're doing first of all is we're using our prior beliefs and we're multiplying 
prior probability of our particular values that we are considering, M and C, in order to get our prior. Then the likelihood, this is just the code version of the equations that I showed in the previous slide. We are calculating the probability of our observed Y data based around the fact that that is normally distributed centered on our regression equation. Um, so M is a parameter, X is our observed data, and C is another parameter. And again, we're saying that this has a certain standard deviation. And we're using this prod function, that's short for product, which basically, basically says multiply all of these things together for all of the X and Y data points that we have. Finally, we have the posterior, and we're, cal we're calculating this by simply multiplying the likelihood times the prior. And so this function will return um, the posterior when we give it some parameters and some data. Now, what we're going to do, it, what we could do is I, we could assess the posterior for um, any particular slope and parameter combination, so any particular set of M and C values. And what would be quite good is if we actually, we don't know what the true parameters are if we were doing this with real data. And so what we're going to do is actually to consider many different possible combinations of M and C, and we're going to work out the posterior belief of all of these things given our data. So the second code cell here is simply setting up a grid of numbers where we're going to consider values of M going from minus three to three, and values of C going from minus one to one. And in the, the bottom code cell, we are simply looping over all of these possible parameters of M and C and for each one of those, we are calculating our posterior belief for the parameters given um, the data that we have observed. So if we actually uh, run this and uh, visualize it, we now get this very interesting plot here. So now what we have on the right hand side, first of all, let's look at the parameter space. Again, just to recap, we have values of the slope going from minus three to three. We've got values of the intercept going from minus one to one. And I showed you this before in terms of our prior beliefs and it was very diffuse. We, before we saw the data, we thought there could be many, many plausible um, combinations of M and C. But now what we're showing is the posterior, what we just calculated. And what we're seeing now is that our posterior beliefs have really shrunk. They have really tightened up. And so what we're saying here is that there are many parameter combinations of M and C, which are very implausible given the data that we happen to have observed. But we can see this this white streak here, and this basically represents more plausible values of slopes and parameters. But let's look at that in a bit more detail. So we can see that we know our true parameters because we, we defined them, we're simulating our data, and that's at the red spot. We can also say, what is our best guess? What is the most likely um, set of parameters and what we're seeing here is shown by the the blue dot so just by eyeballing this our best guess is perhaps that M is maybe just a bit below 1 and that C is um, around minus 0.25 now that is what's called a point estimate you could say the best guess is this, that M is, say, 
and C is minus 0.25. Now that is actually not exactly true. Um, we know um, that the true slope is 0.5 and the true intercept is 0 because we set that to be the case. But what does that mean? Should we cry because we got the answer wrong? Well, no. Um, something very interesting about the Bayesian approach is that we don't just have a best guess, but we have a whole degree of belief, a whole set of beliefs about many possible parameter values. So if we actually look at this big kind of diagonal streak here of plausible values, we can see that, oh yes, our best guess is not quite right. But we can see that the true answers are actually assigned as being really rather plausible um, under our prior beliefs. We're going to look at this in a bit more detail in the next slide or two. But let's move over to the left hand plot where we're looking at um, data space just to see you know how we're doing here. We have the true regression line shown by the red line and our best guess is shown by the blue line. Um, Yes, it's not exactly right, but that's kind of forgivable. The data is pretty noisy here. So while we see that we're not exactly right, what we're going to see elaborated in the next slide um, is that actually our, our prior beliefs are still quite broad and there are many possible uh, plausible values. So let's, let's look at that in a bit more detail. What we're going to do uh, for the sake of simplicity is now focus just upon the slope parameter m. Now, what we can do is essentially say, um, what are our posterior beliefs in m? And so what we've essentially done here conceptually is to take the 2D plot that we showed before, but to collapse down over all of the rows so that we now have um, a total posterior um, probability for all of the different possible slopes. And what we're seeing here is that um, we have a, a distribution of belief over m values that are roughly but not exactly normally distributed. So what we can see is that we, we might want to compare this. What is our distribution of beliefs in M uh, relative to some special value? So the special value here might be zero because that might represent uh, no slope. You know, there's no main effect of X, for example. Now, one way that we can um, synthesize or summarize our beliefs from the Bayesian inference is essentially to look at our posterior distribution. So we don't necessarily want to present all these plots in papers just to kind of talk about our results. And so what people would typically do is to look at the uh, what's called the 95% credible region. So what I have here in a light blue shaded region is the 95% credible region. And so this is 95% of the total area of our posterior probabilities falls in between a specific range. Now, I haven't put the numbers here, but you could, um, if you were reporting this in a statistical test, you would basically say, um, this is my uh, what I believe most about M, but the 95% credible regions span this certain range. So you could report that in your paper. What we could also do is to say, is this region, does this region overlap with zero or does it not overlap with zero? And in this particular example, it does not overlap with zero. And so one thing you could say 
is that um, it is pretty unlikely that the slope is zero given the data. So this is one way um, of using a posterior distribution, whether it be a full plot or if it be a, a summary of the mean and the credible region, you can use your posterior beliefs in order to um, describe the results of a Bayesian analysis. We're going to be looking at this uh, much more specifically in part two when we look at um, doing Bayesian analyses in JASP. Now, as a slight aside, I want to mention that um, the Bayesian credible interval is not the same thing as a frequentist confidence interval. Um, so many of you will be familiar with the idea of a 95% confidence interval, but I think it's really important to understand that these are different. And so here is a picture from a talk given by uh, Jake van der Plas, which I think visualizes this um, very clearly. Now, the key to understanding this is to think back to our schematic slide where I was highlighting the differences between the Bayesian and the frequentist regions uh, um, approaches. The frequentist idea, the frequentist approach, assumes that your parameters, your, your hypothesis, is fixed. It is one single thing. The data that you happen to get is one possible realization. And if you repeat your experiment a large number of times, you might get different data. And those different data sets might give you different confidence intervals. And so the 95% the confidence interval is really saying that 95% of experiments, of hypothetical experiments you conduct, will overlap with the true parameter value. Now that is very different from the Bayesian approach, which treats um, the data as known. So if the data is known, you can work out what your beliefs are, and so you can work out what the credible interval is. The thing that is unknown in a Bayesian approach is the state of the world or the hypothesis or the parameter. And so what the 95% Bayesian credible interval is saying is that really there is a 95% chance that um, the true state of the world, the true uh, parameter is within my posterior interval here, my my 95% credible interval. Now that might take a little while um, to fully sink in. It, it does require a bit of thinking about, but this is um, a really important difference that you have to be aware of when you're interpreting what confidence intervals are when you're reading papers and when you interpret what credible intervals are. Okay, now, we have just summarized a um, really important concept of the Bayesian um, posterior distribution, and that's one way that you can summarize um, the results of a Bayesian analysis. Another way that you can summarize the results of a Bayesian analysis is with a thing called a Bayes factor. And this is... Um, Again, quite conceptually different from talking about a credible interval. Um, it's not necessarily mutually exclusive either, but it does tell you a very different thing. The idea with a Bayes factor is to uh, that we want to test a hypothesis. Um, so the most obvious hypothesis in this case is that there is that the slope is zero. Um, so if we remember back to our regression equation, y equals mx plus c, if m is zero, then what we're saying is that there is no main effect of m. So if we draw this dashed line at m equals zero, uh, 
we can see how our prior beliefs that m is zero compares to our posterior beliefs that m is zero. So what we can see here is that according to our prior beliefs we had um, a certain belief that the, the slope is zero. So it was something like 0.015, something like this. Now we computed our posterior distribution of beliefs and this is shown by the blue line. And what we can see is that this has now actually gone down. So this is expressing the fact that um, after we have observed the data, our belief that m is zero has gone down by quite a lot. And this is basically the Bayes factor. How many times has my belief in a certain value, let's say the null hypothesis, gone up or gone down. And what we can see here is that the, the Bayes factor of our hypothesis over the null hypothesis is 0 0.017. Um, now that's, what does that mean? Well, if we, um, it's easier to interpret if we just look at the reciprocal of that. So if we look at uh, one divided by that number, what we get is the, the kind of opposite Bayes factor, if you like. And so 1 divided by 0 0.017 is 58.66. So what we're saying here is that our belief that the slope is 0 has gone down 58.6 times after having observed the data. Now this is um, quite an interpretable thing here because we're talking about a ratio between our prior beliefs and our posterior beliefs. Um, and anyone can say, well, my belief going down 58 times, that is quite significant, that sounds meaningful, that's a large multiple my belief didn't change by some small fraction, um, it changed 58 times. But um, what we can do is we can look up a table of kind of, is this, is this strong? Um, you don't have to use this table, you could just say 58 times. Um, but looking up this table, our Bayes factor is 1 over 58. And so um, according to this, what we have is extreme evidence for H1 compared to H0. So what we're saying here is that we've got extreme evidence that the slope is not zero compared to uh, the evidence that the slope is zero. So let's just go back to our Bayes factor plot to look at this a bit more. Hopefully you can see um, that this is potentially quite useful. It does now allow you um, to look at the evidence both for and against um, the, the null hypothesis. So this is, this is kind of good and useful. It allows us to use the same kind of language of null hypothesis versus hypothesis um, and so on. But that doesn't capture everything. So for example, it doesn't capture anything about the most likely value of M or the, the M with the highest degree of posterior belief. And so uh, one of the criticisms about a Bayes factor is that it really only focuses um, on, on a specific value, a specific kind of null hypothesis. Um, and so if we skip forward a couple of slides, um, one thing I want you to be aware of is that there is um, an ongoing debate about the, the relative usefulness of using Bayes factors versus posterior distributions.
Um, now, there's no reason why you can't actually look at both of these things. Um, and I have to say, I have not deeply read into um, this debate, and I, I personally have not drawn a concrete conclusion about the usefulness of Bayes' factors versus describing the posterior distribution. My hunch is that the posterior distribution tells you more. Um, that said, there are um, some solid reasons why you might want to carry on using the, the language of hypothesis testing. So what I've done is to provide you with a couple of papers which talk about this debate um, and argue for one side or the other. So you can go and read these papers if you're particularly interested. Now that covers basically what I wanted to talk about. Just to, to briefly summarise, we have covered core concepts in Bayesian analysis and we've gone through a concrete example of how to do this so that it's not mysterious. It's all relatively simple, a few concrete steps. And we ended with the idea of presenting the results of a Bayesian analysis in the form of describing your posterior beliefs and or by describing um, a Bayes factor. So these, these are the key takeaway messages. So what I'm doing here is giving you some resources. So we've got a couple of papers. These will be available um, online for you to go and find. Um, these are some particularly useful introductory papers. Um, we also have textbooks. So I've mentioned the Zoltan Dain's book before. This is, I think, particularly good. It focuses on um, the conceptual ideas. Um, it's quite good because it looks not just at the Bayesian approach, but also the frequentist approach and likelihood and so on. The, there's a book, Doing Bayesian Data Analysis, by Krushki. This is good, but um, it's quite a big book. It's also quite kind of low level in that it focuses on um, programming um, and doing things yourself. The, similarly, um, there's a nice book by uh, Richard McElwraith um, called Statistical Rethinking. Um, it's along the same lines, um, slightly different style, both very interesting. But um, for beginners, I would definitely recommend the Zoltan Daim's book. Um, there are loads of resources about Bayesian inference. Um, if you are really interested in and really want to dive in, Richard McElwraith has an entire lecture series, um, so 10, 20 odd lectures, which you might be interested in diving into if you have the time. Um, I'm also highlighting one particularly interesting blog post here. It, if you um, kind of like coding and going through worked examples, um, this might be particularly interesting to you. So there's a series of five blog posts which compares um, frequentist and Bayesian analyses. And this again is by Jake van der Plas. So um, that's the end of part one. Hopefully this has been really interesting um, I would not worry if um, this did not go in the first time. We're talking about some quite new and some quite difficult concepts, new terms. Um, but I hope going through the concrete example has made that um, real and tangible. Um, okay, so part two will be uh, elsewhere and this will take a very different approach. We're going to look at how you concretely go about running analyses yourself, no programming, just using uh, the free point and click software called JASP. So that's it for me for the moment.